I'm pleased to introduce to you our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Nat Irvin. Dr. Irvin is a graduate of the Institute for Educational Management, Harvard University Graduate School of Education. He also received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Philosophy and a Master's degree in Media Arts from the University of South Carolina and a Doctor of Musical Arts from the University of North Texas. Dr. Irvin is a futurist. He created Future Focus to lead members of minority groups in discussions about the future and to help identify the significant social, technological, economic, environmental, and political trends and events that will have the greatest effect on the minority community by the year 2000. He is an editorial writer for the Winston-Salem Journal and a frequent contributor to several major newspapers. Dr. Irvin has spent 20 years in education and nonprofit management, including eight years as Vice Chancellor for Development and University Relations at Winston-Salem State University. Currently, he is an educator in residence at Wake Forest University and a partner in North Carolina-based Irvin Goforth and Irvin Training and Communications, a consulting firm dedicated to advancing, advancing communications and performance in changing environments. He is a member of various boards and councils and a member of the World Future Society. Let us welcome Dr. Irvin.
The country, indeed the world, was still abuzz over the historic achievement that occurred two weeks earlier when the United States elected as its first president a graduate of a historically black college and university, a product of Cheney University, the class of 1998. The appearance by America's first black president-elect attracted hundreds of participants from the national and international world, including people from Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, Mexico, Central America, Western, Southern Africa, Brazil, Britain, and Canada. Now I'd like to pause for a minute and ask, would the first black president of the United States please stand up so that we can recognize you now?
In the developing countries of the West, new technology led to big productivity increases that caused high economic growth. Actually, waves of technology that continued to roll out through the early part of the 21st century. Then there was the ascendance of Asia, the process of globalization. These two men are trends, said Rodney Carter, the third, who was an international economist. He said these two men are trends, fundamental technological change and a new ethos of openness had transformed the world into the beginning of a global civilization and a new civilization of civilization that would blossom for the next 25 years. And African Americans, like the rest of the world, was dead. Black leadership was completely redefined. Jesse Jackson had failed. Al Sharpton was gone. Louis Farrakhan were all names of the past. Indeed, baby boomers were out. It was the millennial generation. And they came with new heroes. And they had new attitudes. They were people like Vincent Brown, April Davin, Chris McQuinn, the Vita Scales, names like Christina Lee, Angela Lee. These were some of the new heroes. Indeed, black America's heroes had shifted away from the athletes and the entertainers. Gangster rap and the Hollywood scene had lost its hold on the youth. Other voices, newer voices, were beginning to be heard. Stalwart organizations like the NAACP and the Urban League that were created during the Industrial Age. These were downsized, completely restructured. New, smaller, nonprofit organizations with narrower focus, narrowly focused mission on education and entrepreneurship were formed with other historic black colleges and universities. By 2020, the astounding thing was that black America had reached economic parity not only with the majority, its economic strength had grown faster, percentage-wise, than any other minority group. By 2020, in just 22 years, you remember back in 1997, the number of black businesses had more than tripled to 1.3 million, with income of over $1 trillion, investing in all four ways of technology, including computers, telecommunications, biotechnology, and something called nanotechnology, contributing to a surge of economic activity. At the end of the 20th century, back in 1997, over 107 historic black colleges and universities had been serving nearly 300,000 students across the nation. And the world, continuing their legacy of hope, education, and service, Few people expected Chain University to still be around in the year 2020, said the president-elect of the United States. But we are proud we'll still here, vibrant and relevant, she said on that day. <laughs> But the 2020 participants had not just gathered to celebrate the past. They had come to celebrate the past of the future, the history of the future, the words not yet written, the steps not yet taken, the bridges not yet crossed, the horizons not yet seen. By the way, I should have told you this, that that symposium, the one on Saturday, it was seen by millions of people around the world through something called an intranet designed by some of the computer studies students at Chain University, developed way back in 1999. And here's what the students did. See, they took advantage of the fact that the United States had immigrants coming in at a rate of a million a year so, and they were attending the ethnically diverse historical black colleges, so they seized upon their natural advantage in building relationships internationally. You know, there were a lot of 
changes in higher education. That's something else they talk about. In the latter portion of the 20th century, people like Alvin Toffler and Peter Drucker talked about this knowledge economy, and how knowledge was changing everything. That the, there was an economic order in which knowledge, not labor, or raw materials, or capital would be the key resource. A social order in which inequality based on knowledge would be a major challenge. And a poverty in which government could not be looked to for solving economic problems. Now this was a very elusive kind of concept, and it caught some of the colleges and universities by surprise, but it didn't catch you by surprise. It didn't catch any university by surprise. I think there was a young student whose name was Melinda Yancey, who was interested in education. And there was another Humphrey scholar who had already planned to reposition the school system of the District of Columbia when she made her comments at lunch that day, back in 1997. In the year 2003, they thought about it too. This was looking back toward the future. The university, the faculty, and the trustees voted to change the name of the university so that it became the first historically black college and university in the world that was open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It changed the city of Philadelphia. Chaney students understood the meaning of knowledge in the information age that you could redistribute land and money, but it was much longer to redistribute education or information. They understood that. Yes, there were many, many new opportunities, and little known Chaney University helped spark a revolution that led to a revolution in learning and higher education. Of course, as you know, even in 1997, celebrating the 180th anniversary that Cheney was long known for its teacher education program. But it was Cheney over the next five years that developed a new concept of learning where they targeted the family and not just students. Families as learning. This innovative approach led to a boom in entrepreneurial activities within urban America for blacks and other minorities who continue to make the majority make up the majority of those attending the HBCU. The faculty at Cheney University even had an effect on Jesse Jackson Jr. Caused him to leave Congress. He and a number of other investors invested in something called private academies. They spent two and a half billion dollars reestablishing networks dedicated to education, private institutions. Urban America began to talk about creation of wealth and not jobs. Now about the family, Cheney's family, as you know. Cheney's family was much more diverse than it had ever been before. Blacks married whites, whites married whites, whites married Asians, Asians married non-Asians. It continued to go up. The age of everybody got older, but they were healthy and they were happy. Many universities became the universities of color as opposed to just being black. This was due in part to the large increase in enrollment by Latino, who by 2020 was 70% of the population, well surpassing the 13% of African Americans and 6% of Asian Americans. Finally, as I bring all this to a close, I've spoken to you about the year 2020. There's something else magical about the year 2020 as well. 2020 represents the fifth century for African Americans. It represents the fifth century for a dream for 20 black folks back in Jamestown. An extraordinary accomplishment. So I say to Cheney University, as you get swept up in this next few days about 2,000, take advantage.
advantage of the opportunity to go further out. There's only, I think it's 18,625 hours left for the year 2000. That's not far enough away. You want to know what 2000 is going to look like as I was telling Dr. Pettis today? Well, add five pounds if you're over 40 per year. Get a little break and go outside and you can see it. Go further. Go to the year 2020. Go to 2010, 2015 where we lose gravity. And I say to you, and I say to Cheney University family, it is time for us to begin to celebrate not just the past, but the history of the future. I thank you very much for having me.
Pam West invited the men of Pecan to a basketball game here at the university and suggested to us that since we donate academically, couldn't we donate in other ways, which we always do, we reminded her. But what we had done was uh, decided to buy the basketball team to men and women, home and away uniforms. I think it would also be appropriate for me to ask Mrs. Logan if she would step up. And I'd like to present her with one of the plates also. Originating with 
concern of Richard Humphrey is a Quaker philanthropist over the social and economic rights of blacks. And whereas truly deserving of praise and recognition, Taney University of Pennsylvania has consistently endeavored to provide the highest quality of education to its students, thereby contributing to the welfare of the community at large. Now, therefore, the Senate of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania heartily congratulates Cheney University of Pennsylvania upon this joyous and momentous occasion, offers best wishes for a continued tradition of educational excellence in the years to come, and directs that a copy of this document, sponsored by Senator Clarence P. Bell and Senator Robert Thompson, be transmitted to Cheney University of Pennsylvania, signed by Mark Corrigan, Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, good luck. Thank you, sir. And right on time, the House of Representatives has shown up. One of our alums, State Representative Mike Horsey, comes in the call. resolutions uh, passed in the Pennsylvania State House by uh, unanimous vote by all the members. The resolutions read as follows. Whereas Richard Humphreys was born on February the 13th, 1750, toward the British Virgin Islands and arrived in Philadelphia as a teen to receive apprenticeship training in goldsmithing and silversmithing. And whereas Richard Humphrey was a dedicated member of the Society of Friends, an active citizen in community affairs, a philanthropist who valiantly served as a captain in the colonial army during the Revolutionary War. And whereas upon his death in 1832, Richard Humphrey's convictions led him to donate a portion of his wealth for the purpose of educating former slaves. And whereas Cheney University of Pennsylvania the first institution in America devoted to vocational education of descendants of the African race was founded in 1837. And whereas Cheney University of Pennsylvania has continued its proud heritage and celebrates 160 years of service to the academic community in 1997. Therefore, be it resolved that the House of Representatives of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania memorialize the Citizens Committee of the United States Postal Service to consider and recommend to the United States Postal Service Board of Governors the issuance of a commemorative stamp honoring Richard Humphreys. <laughs> Thanks. 
pencil's out, the computer's out, the typewriter's out, and write those letters to the Postal Service, to your legislators, and let's get that commemorative stamp. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Our theme for this, the 160th anniversary, is We Are Family. If you are from my generation, I suspect the phrase, we are family, make you think about a special group in American music. Well, we do not have the entire group here today, but we have one of the members of Sister Slave.
We have come here today to celebrate the past. We have come here today to analyze the present. We have come here today to declare that we are family. Not a dysfunctional family, but a family whose members are friends. And we have come today to gaze into the future as presented to us by our speaker, Dr. Nathaniel Nelson. We have come to pay homage to Chamber University as it was, as it is, and as it shall be. On this occasion, let us dedicate and rededicate ourselves to this glorious institution so that her future will be even more magnificent than her past. Let us in this present not only look to the future, but work for the future. Shane's future must not simply happen. We must make it happen. We thank all of you for coming, alumni, men of the town, council trustees, Humphrey scholars, faculty, students, retirees, friends of Shane University. We thank you for being a part of this celebration. Please stand now and join the Cheney University Choir in singing the Alma Mater, followed by the closing meditation by Ms. Salinda Garrett. And we ask you to remain standing until the end of the recession. Tribulations bring patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And it is through hope that God's love is shed abroad in our hearts. May this hope spread throughout infinite, infinite generations, allowing peace and tranquility to reign as we continue to live in the Cheney legend. God bless you all.
Hi, my name is Sadia Latimer and I'm a freshman at Cheney University. I just would like to ask you a few questions. Are you a Cheney University alumni? No, unfortunately I am not. But I, after, especially after today, I sure wish that I, I was because uh, it was so much inspiration here today and what a wonderful occasion for their 160th anniversary. And I feel honored to be a part of it. Um, we would like to introduce her name. She's from the Sledge Sisters. Yes, I'm Kathy. My name is Kathy Sledge and I'm from yeah, the Sister Sledge group. Okay. She sang a wonderful song. She sang the Star Spangled Banner. I would like to know, how did you like this occasion? Well, I thought there was a, a you could feel the warmth in the room, and you could also feel uh, just the strength in such a strong institution, which is a cornerstone in our culture. And his, it was an historical event. Thank would you, you say you felt the spirit of God in here? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yes, first and foremost. <laughs> We'd like to thank you for coming out, and may you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank God you bless. so much.